Hi, this is Mike Dilt with the Relax Back UK show on UK Health Radio, your global real feel-good radio station. On the Relax Back UK show, we explore all kinds of health topics, so keep listening and enjoy the ride. Thank you for joining me, Mike Dilk, on the Relax Back UK show. Now, the topic this week is very male orientated, and there are no apologies for that. However, I do want women to listen, and if any of what is mentioned might be relevant to any of the men in your life, suggest, cajole, bully, or even physically drag them to the doctor to do something about it. The topic is the prostate. If you ask 100 men where their prostate is, and an embarrassingly large number would unfortunately not know. They might sort of vaguely point sort of below the belt, and, that, and that's about it. The first guest is Dr. Roger Henderson, and he talks about prostate cancer, what to look out for, the possible symptoms, what to do if you're worried, and yes, some of the tests for it. Well, it's it's interesting that I mean it's not something you'd sort of not normally want to think about over your breakfast, but when when you do sort of do what's called a digital rectal examination and the old cliche in medicine, if you don't put your finger in it, you put your foot in it. You know, you have to examine <laughs> someone. Heard that. Then we moved on to enlarged prostates that are not cancerous but can cause problems. So it doesn't heat up the nerves or any of the important important plumbing that that's nearby. So it has a very favourable side effect profile. It doesn't tend to upset sexual function, nor does it upset urinary control or, or you know, and there, there is no risk of urinary incontinence, which some men obviously will worry about with the bigger yeah. procedures. Roger Henley is a consultant urological surgeon and Charles Blanford, who is a, paint, who is a patient, explain some of the different options. This is important stuff. So please do keep listening. The station that makes you feel good. It used to be hard to find the world's most wonderful alcohol-free drinks. Not anymore. Whether it's a health thing, a lifestyle thing, or you're trying new things. Make sure you save yourself from the guessing game of the supermarket shelves and shop with zerozilchzip.co.uk for the world's most carefully curated range of alcohol-free beers, wines, spirits and more. Health Radio listeners can save 5% with the code HEALTH5. Visit zerozilchzip.co.uk or click our banner on the UK Health Radio website. Discover alcohol freedom with Zero Zilch Zip. Because nothing's better. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. So with my first guest, Dr. Roger Henderson, we got right straight into the basics. What is the prostate? What does it do? Where is it? Okay. Well, it's very interesting. Sort of, it's a bit like pin the tail on a donkey. If you ask a hundred men where their prostate is, and an embarrassingly large number would unfortunately not know. They might sort of vaguely point sort of below the belt, and and that's about it. So your prostate gland basically sits at the base of your bladder. It should be about the size of a walnut, uh, and it's essential for normal sexual health functioning. It produces liquids involved, you know, with the normal production of sperm, and, you know, we don't even know it's there. Now, as we get older, in every single man of us, um, it steadily steadily starts to get bigger in size, and that's normal. One of the problems, though, is that it's one of the uh, areas in men where cancer cells typically develop. Um, And there are around sort of uh, 58,000 cases of of, of prostate cancer in the UK uh, every year, sort of between 50 and 60,000. So that's about one in eight men. Now, Does anyone uh, know why cancer cells might particularly develop in your prostate or is it just one of those sad facts of life? 
Well, there are a number of risk factors um, that, that, that we seem to know does put you more at risk. One is a family history. So if your dad you know, had it or your brother's got it, you're, you may be slightly more at risk. If you're significantly overweight, if you're obese, that's uh, a risk factor. And also an ethnic group. So prostate cancer is more common in Afro-Caribbean men, for example, and less common in Asian men. And also diet, and it may be linked to the obesity side, but diet is also a known risk factor. So as with many other cancers, a diet high in fat uh, and low in fruit and vegetables might increase your risk. Um, But probably the big one, and the one that you and I can't do anything about, is simply getting older. Um, The older you get, the more likely you are to have it, especially over the age of 75 um, and there's nothing we can do about that but there is quite a lot we can do about things like obesity um, yeah. and, and, and diet but it can feel a little bit like a lottery sometimes if I'm honest. Sure all right so now as we get older so I'm 56 and I have to admit I've, I've experienced this sometimes in the night you need to get up and wee. Now are, are these two two things connected you know if you have if, if your prostate gets a bit larger does it put some pressure on your bladder or have I just drunk too much beer? Well, there, there is that. I mean, you and me both. I mean, I'm 61, so we're both of a certain age. <laughs> and, and if you have a few pints, you're going to get up the night before, um, uh, uh, the night after. But um, there are some general key symptoms to look out for here. Now, these are linked to both prostate cancer and harmless prostate enlargement. So don't start worrying if you've got these symptoms, you might have prostate cancer, but these are the ones to look out for. So as you say, getting up several times at night, you know, not just the once, but but sort of several times. Um, when you do go to pee, you, you, you've got a poor flow, you know, you've got a poor stream, you don't have the force that you used to have when you were 21. And you also might have to stand at the loo and wait a little bit before you start to pee. You may slightly stop and start. So, you know, you, 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 you're peeing and then you seem to tail off and then you start peeing again. Or you well, may. Let, let me interrupt you. I thought that was a good thing to like see if you can do. Oh, like, if, you, if, you, if you're trying to do it, to, to squeeze your pelvic muscles, you know, to sort of improve that. That's the exercise we sometimes say, try and stop midstream. But that's a that conscious. That's good for. That's good to, to strengthen the, the, the floor of your pelvic muscles. OK, right. to make sure that you've got good pelvic muscle strength there, both in men and, and women. We sometimes and that stops you weighing when you don't want to. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, but this classic, is like, if you laugh too hard, you wee. So exactly. Yeah. That's the old stress incontinent side of things. But, uh, but, this, uh, but you, you, you make a conscious effort to sort of stop when you're midstream. This is slightly different when you're peeing, minding your own business, thinking about the world, and it tails off, and then it starts Again, you might need to pee more often. You might need to get to the loo quickly. You might all of a sudden need to drop what you're doing. I've got to go. I've got to, I've got to rush. And you might have a feeling of not quite sort of having fully emptied your bladder once you've been to pee. So all these symptoms um, are, are, are in the mix with, with prostate cancer. Now, it's important also to mention that pain is not normally a symptom. Many men do sometimes think, oh, I haven't got any pain. I haven't got any discomfort. I feel fine. That's not normally a symptom of, of early prostate cancer. So don't be fooled by thinking if you've got no pain, every, every, everything is fine. OK. Now, earlier on in our, our chat, you mentioned a number. And I must admit, it kind of I, I didn't take it in. How many of us men uh, might be getting prostate cancer? Well, we'll start off in the UK. OK, well, in, in, in the UK, and this is fairly reproducible around the world. So we can take this as a fairly good general starting statistic at the moment about 52,000 men um, the last time we did the stats in the UK are diagnosed with prostate cancer in the UK now that's about one in eight men in their lifetime okay Okay. Um, most of those cases are over the age of 75 so I come back to the point the older you get the more likely you get it Um, and there are unfortunately about 12,000 deaths from prostate cancer in the UK every year. I was year. going to say, yeah. So how many out of those one in eight, how many does it kill? Yeah. So, so you know, and the, we're looking at the 80 to 90 year old age group. They're the ones with the, with the biggest mortality, obviously. So say 12,000 uh, deaths a year. Now, it's very important to say before sort of people start panicking, the vast majority of men who do have known prostate cancer 
they will die with their prostate cancer, not from their prostate cancer. In other words, they will die of something else. Yeah. Okay. Um, we it's it's probably the case that almost every man, as they get to a certain age, if they live long enough, would probably start to get cancer cells. So you can probably make a good argument saying if I was to take a hundred men who are a hundred years old and chop them all up when they died. I'd probably find they had prostate cancer cells in their prostate, okay, to a man. Um, and I'm, that's, I'm not uh, sure if that's a, a comforting fact or not, but it, well, either no, way, it, 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 it does sort of reflect just how common how common it is, and and the fact that it is not like some cancers you don't really really don't want to have have shocking statistics, and and you don't want to give that diagnosis. If I'm giving the diagnosis of prostate cancer, I, especially if I catch someone early on with it. I'm always at pains to say, look, you know, the word cancer, it's going to shock you. You're going to go home and have a stiff drink. But this is a different kettle of fish completely to some of the nasty, aggressive ones we can see in younger people. OK, right. if we can, Roger, can we move on to kind of finding it, uh, yeah. checking if, if you have it? So you mentioned some of the potential symptoms. So say if you're you know, a bloke about my age. So I, as I said, I, I'm 56. And uh, you've got some of these possible symptoms and you're thinking, well, you know, maybe I should go and or do something. What's what's next? What what should we do next? Well, the first thing is to do something. Uh, and unfortunately, I mean, we are both blokes. And as blokes, we are notoriously We're bad rubbish, aren't we? yeah. at looking after our health compared to women. We really are. And, and yeah, I'll, I'll touch on that question. But I'll also just touch on why we're so rubbish. We're a bit rubbish for all sorts of reasons. We get embarrassed about going to the doctor. We get anxious. Um, we feel we're too busy. We can put it off. You know, I'll do it another time. Um, we, we've got this sometimes in some men, this slightly macho belief that, you know, admitting that there may be something wrong with you is, is a weakness or a vulnerability. And I think that in some cases that does go back to childhood. If you are brought up, you know, with someone saying to you, big boys don't cry, you know, don't make a fuss. Then if you're not careful when you're an adult, when you're an adult man, you know, it's not big boys don't cry. It's that big men don't go to their doctor. They don't make a fuss. You know, they sit in silence. If you have gone to your doctor in the past as a bloke and you've had a, you know, with a condition and you've sort of screwed up your courage and you've gone to see your healthcare professional and you've either felt you've been a bit dismissed or you haven't been taken seriously, that's probably as well going to stop you going back next time quite so quickly and also these days obviously you can go on online you know, dr google you know is, is is out there and you know people will look at their symptoms and either you know get it wrong and think oh this is fine or they'll think well i'll, I'll just put it off and i'll i'll come back and visit it another day so that's a bit why we're rubbish at going but we obviously should go because with prostate cancer the sooner we get it picked up if it's there the, the better. Now, the nice thing about prostate cancer, if I can use that term, is if you were to come to see me with a set of symptoms, I could do a simple little blood test um, called a PSA blood test, which would show if there was the potential for cancer cells being present um, in, in, in your body. I could do a, a physical examination of your prostate gland just to see if they, it felt normal or it felt enlarged or if I had any concerns about that. Uh, hang on. So a cu cu couple of questions there. The, the, the blood test. Yeah. Do you have to get that done at a GP? The reason I asked that is I was talking to someone about a cholesterol test uh, yeah. and it was talking to a GP, actually. And they said, well, actually, you go to your pharmacist. It's much quicker, much easier because we all know GPs are kind of busy at the minute. Is that Can that test for prostate cancer be done at the pharmacy? You shouldn't. Um, you, you, you should always go and get it done through a hospital laboratory because accuracy is all with these. Right. Um, the thing about um, uh, the, the PSA blood test is that if you have a raised level, so if you were to come to me and we did a PSA blood test and it was found to be up, that does not in turn mean automatically you have prostate cancer. In fact, the majority of raised PSA blood tests are not linked to cancer. What it does mean is whether we should investigate you further. Okay. Right. Um, so it's, it's an imperfect test in, in, in some ways, but it's the, it's the best we've got. And it's a very good test of actually looking to see if there may be a problem. Now, some people are really surprised that, you know, we don't have a national prostate screening program in the UK. 
you know, so breast, um, cervix, um, but we don't do prostate. And it's, it's controversial. So you've got a blood test, you know, if it shows you've got a high PSA, you might have prostate cancer, but because there are other causes of a high PSA, you know, if all men were screened, we'd find many men with a raised PSA level. You'd then investigate and treat quite a lot of those men unnecessarily with some of the risks and side effects of the investigations that treatment uh, and treatment that would go with that. To put simply, you know, some people do believe that screening for all men may do more harm than good, but it's a hot topic. I'm a big fan of, of the PSA test. And certainly if you're over the age of 50, it is now completely advisable and acceptable for you to go along to your GP and say, I'd like a PSA test, please. Right. And they should they should give you give you one. So the, the, the next part of the, the test, which might be what turn off or concern some men, actually, because with a little bit of a smirk, some people might say, oh, it's rubber glove time. Yeah, because that, actually, the next part of the test ain't that pleasant, potentially. Well, it's it's interesting that I mean it's not something you'd sort of not normally want to think about over your breakfast, but when when you do sort of do what's called a digital rectal examination, and the old cliche in medicine, if you don't put your finger in it, you put your foot in it. You know, you have to examine <laughs> I someone. I haven't heard that. <laughs> um, it, it's once you you know you get many men sort of thinking, oh, well, do, you know, here we go, and sort of intake of breath, and then afterwards they go, well, actually, I. I that was, I didn't know what I was worried about. That was fine. So it's not, it's one of those tests where if you haven't had it done before, you can think, oh, I'd rather not have that done. Or I don't like the sound of that. And afterwards you go, actually, that was okay. Um, so it's one of those um, little, little tests, but it's not the only test that we would do. I mean, so if, again, coming back to you, if you had a raised PSA, I did, you know, your PSA and it was up did a digital rectal examination and, and thought, well, your, your prostate gland's a little bit, uh, a little bit you know, larger than it might be. You don't leave it there, okay? Because with the digital examination, you can only get to one part of the prostate, the moon behind it. You've you got the cancer of the prostate. Uh, we need some treatment. What next? Well, there's a whole range. But there's no sort of one size fits all because the answer to that question, uh, Mike, is, is that it depends on the... The, the staging of where we've caught your, your prostate cancer. So it, it is complicated and varies tremendously be diff, between different cases. Um, and many men may choose to have different treatments compared to other men with, you know, with prostate cancer. Personal choice does come in here. But essentially, we've got surgery, taking the prostate out. We've got radiotherapy, hormone treatment, uh, to shut down the supply of the hormones that feed prostate cancer and less commonly chemotherapy and, and, and often a combination of these is, is used. There's also a treatment which does surprise many men, which is no treatment called watchful waiting, surveillance. Right. And if you've got, an, uh, for example, an, uh, an older man and a, with, with a relatively um, mildly raised PSA with a prostate cancer that we know is contained within his cancer. It's relatively small, doesn't look like it's going anywhere. It is quite in order to, if you like, to sit yeah. on that cancer and do nothing can, with it. Because as I say, can, the likelihood can, can is that, that sit there. A, something else will get him first. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so that's one end of the one extreme of the treatment spectrum. On the other, on the other extreme, we've got taking the taking the whole of the prostate out, having radiotherapy, having hormone treatments, so throwing the kitchen sink at it. And and you know, obviously, the younger you are, if you've got men down in their forties, for example, with prostate cancer, which you can very occasionally see, and I have seen a number of times, then you do tend to throw the kitchen sink at that because, unfortunately, that tends to be slightly aggressive right. so there's this whole range of treatments now the good news is projecting um, over the next 15 years in terms of death rates from prostate cancer it does look like they are going to be falling and that's through a combination of better treatments and men starting to come forward earlier than they did 10 or 20 years ago the message is getting through it's slow it's steady we're not there yet but more men are coming forward and, and overcoming their embarrassment and saying, look, doc, you know, I'd quite like to get this checked out, which is obviously just a good thing. Let, let me ask what's probably an impossible question, but I'm sure one that your patients ask you when they've been diagnosed yeah. is, OK, if I have surgery or maybe any of the other treatments, will everything still work? 
Very good, very good question. The big risk, um, it is a trade-off. And certainly with um, heavy-duty surgery, uh, a total prostatectomy, by which I mean you take the whole of the prostate, with heavy-duty hormonal treatment where we're shutting down your male hormones, shutting the fuel supply off to that prostate gland, you are fighting fire with fire. And very often you have to sit down and say, look, basically we're going to save your life, but we might affect your libido, we might you know, affect your sex drive, we might cause you know, problems with erectile dysfunction in the future. You know, there is this trade-off. The majority of men will sail very happily through their treatment. They may get some side effects like hot flushes, tiredness and fatigue from radiotherapy, all sorts of things. But they, they happily trade that for staying alive um, at the end of the day. So, so any treatment that doesn't have potential side effects doesn't work. Full stop. That's a given in medicine. So you you explain carefully, but you don't know. You can have someone who has relatively mild treatment who will get side effects, and you get someone who you throw everything at, um, and they sail through absolutely fine. You unfortunately really don't know if you're going to be someone who um, gets complicated with side effects until after the event. But most men would still say, "Doesn't matter. I'm just want this gone." All right. So. So finally, uh, if, if people are worried, go and see your GP, even though in the time we've been talking, actually, your GP should have seen two patients and we all know they're very busy. Um, just go and see your GP because they will take you seriously. Abs abs absolutely. I mean, one, one of my um, one of the things I'm doing most at the moment in my surgery is coping with the consequences of COVID, not with COVID cases, but with dealing with the backlog of problems that have built up yeah. um, through that time when people weren't able to get you know, the normal um, uh, access to healthcare that they would pre-pandemic. And some of that does involve dealing with, with men who've you know, we've picked up their, their raised, raised PSA. So the question, if in doubt, get checked out. You know, that old saying, absolutely. Um, if you need to speak to your GP on the phone first, do that because they may listen to you and say, that's fine. We'll get the PSA blood test, have the blood test. I'll ring you with the result. You know, see you after that, do an examination. So you don't have to, if you like, to physically go in, make that phone call first. Your GP may want to see you or they may just crack on with a PSA test in the meantime anyway. OK, all right. So <laughs> we, we, we've got a message coming through loud and clear, really, haven't we? To all men. But actually, let's make the message wider than that. Partners as well. Just pester them a little bit and make them go to the dentist. You know, wives, girlfriends, prod your other half and <laughs> tell them to swallow their pride and go to the GP. Absolutely. I tell, you, I tell you the truth. Half of all the men that come to see me with a potential prostate problem come in with a wife or partner in tow. Um, and it's usually them that have, you know, said, we're going. And this, this chap sort of trails along rather sheepishly behind. But that's fine. I, you know, I don't care if it's your wife, your partner, you know, or your dog that drags you in to, <laughs> to see me, you know, as long as you're in to see me. I get it. Right. Um, Dr. Henderson, thank you very much indeed for chatting. This is important stuff. So uh, many thanks for your time. Not at all. And just before I go, Mike, can I just mention a website in case people are wondering about, Please do. you know, um, uh, there's this website called Manversation, M-A-N-V-E-R-S-A-T-I-O-N, -E like conversation, but manversation.co.uk. UK and this is this is a, a fantastic website where you can actually um, there's an appointment planner you can actually download this and you can before you go into your GP and you can think of the questions you want uh, you, you, to, to say to your GP you can answer some of the questions on there so you can GP can see what uh, what your concerns are so if you're embarrassed or anxious about going that's a great place to start and take it along with you to get the ball rolling with your GP. Sounds like very good advice. All right. Well, thanks uh, once again. Many thanks indeed. Pleasure, Mike. Thanks for having me on. This show is cool. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good.
It used to be hard to find the world's most wonderful alcohol-free drinks. Not anymore. Whether it's a health thing, a lifestyle thing, or you're trying new things, make sure you save yourself from the guessing game of the supermarket shelves and shop with zerozilchzip.co.uk for the world's most carefully curated range of alcohol-free beers, wines, spirits, and more. Health Radio listeners can save 5% with the code HEALTH5. Visit zerozilchzip.co.uk or click our banner on the UK Health Radio website. Discover alcohol freedom with Zero Zilch Zip. Because nothing's better. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. So with my next guests, those are Richard Hindley, he's a consultant urological surgeon, and Charles Blanford, he's a patient. We talk about the problems that an enlarged prostate can cause when it, it, it's big to cause some issues, but it's not cancerous. And actually, for my chat with them, I did start off with a bit of a plea. And the topic is benign prostatic hyperplasia. So guys, please, for my own sanity, um, is there a shortened version of benign prostatic hyperplasia? Yes, there is. We, we abbreviate it to BPH or, or con- maybe slightly confusingly, it's also called bladder outlet obstruction, which is BOO. And then sometimes people label it as BPE, benign prostatic enlargement. But essentially, it's, it's a very, very common condition of the aging male. And, uh, and, and a lot of men will have troublesome urinary symptoms because of their benign prostatic hyperplasia or enlargement. It means the same thing. Okay, well, let's run with BPH for purposes of, uh, of, of my, my, my sanity. Um, so, all right, you kind of alluded there, uh, Richard, uh, to what, what it is, but can you just sort of go over again, you know, what, what is BPH? Yeah, sure. It's, it's a very common condition of the aging male. Our prostate glands sit just underneath the bladder and the urethra or water pipe um, runs through the prostate gland as urine exits the bladder. As we get older, because of the male hormone testosterone, which we all produce, our prostates grow. It's a sort of quirk of, of male physiology that our prostates grow from maybe the size of a walnut when we're in our teens or early 20s, uh, and it can grow sometimes to the size of a, uh, in extreme cases, of a small watermelon, but usually uh, more of a squash ball. And, small and in, watermelon sounds massive. Yeah, that's unusual. <laughs> that is that's un- very that's extreme. Unusual. Yeah, no, that, that is extreme, but it's that increase in size of the prostate gland that then sort of constricts and compresses and kinks the urethra and results in an obstruction when we're trying to pass urine and you know at least 50 percent of men over the age of 50 will be aware that they've had some changes in their symptoms as they got older and a significant minority of them at at some stage or other will end up going to see their gp or you know seeing a specialist uh, because those urinary symptoms are starting to impact on quality of life which i'm sure charles can, can tell you about yeah, so yeah, tell us. So what are the, the the symptoms, I suppose, that first brings this to mind? Is it as simple as just sort of waking up in the night to go for a pee? Well, well, yes, it is. I mean, urinary flow symptoms, and that, that's that's the thing. Uh, and um, more disrupted sleep during the night um, is, is a feature of it. And, um, you know, what I found over time, that, that, that slowly it got, um, you know, worse and worse. And... Um, one of the ways it impacted me during the day was um, with with my my travel arrangements and being able to go places. You know, I'm always looking out for 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 a loo and things like that. So yeah, it is a bit of a, a bit of a hassle. But it's not it's not cancerous. All you do is you, you know you kind of you pee a bit more. Maybe well, that's just you, part you, of getting you, older. Don't we have well, to just suck it up and get on with it? Well, you, you say that, but uh, you, you know. You do have to pee a bit more. So there's a couple of questions there. It's like, well, where do you go to have a pee if you're out and about? It's not always very easy to find a public convenience, especially with a number of public conveniences that have been uh, closed in the last 10 years or so. 
Um, Near where uh, I live, they've all uh, been converted into restaurants. Yeah, and, and hairdressing salons in the case of Blandford. Um, and um, the, the other the other thing is um, that, uh, what was I going to say, forgot what I was going to say now. Um, well, we, we were talking about sort of why, why yeah. bother? I mean, does it lead on to more serious issues? Yes, well, it does, because, um, you know, in, in my case, I found that uh, I was sort of pursuing uh, DIY strategies to, so that I didn't have to pee quite so much. So therefore, I was drinking less. And because I wasn't drinking enough, I was poorly hydrated. And because I was poorly hydrated, I then had a whole pattern of um, urinary tract infections. So urinary tract infections are really quite nasty things. You know, they're not very good for you at all. Right. OK, so, well, perhaps we can bring Richard in, in here. What what is a urinary tract infection and what you know what do you, what do you do about it? Why does it come about if you have this uh, the BPH? Sure. Um, no, it's a good question. I mean, just going back to the symptoms, the what and I'll, I'll answer that question. But the ones that bother men the most are sleep disruption. If they're getting up three or four times at night, you know they're exhausted the next day, and also when they're out and about, you know, worrying about where the nearest loo is, as as was mentioned. And, and, you know, having that urgency and sometimes that results in incontinence, which is extremely embarrassing. Um, when the prostate enlarges, <clears throat> there's also a risk that men can get bleeding from the prostate and, and have urinary infections, which sometimes end up resulting in hospitalization and can be quite nasty. Um, some men also can have a complete stoppage where they suddenly can't pass urine and have to have a catheter inserted. Oh, OK. That's starting to get really, I don't like the sound of that. No. And, and with the urine infections, I mean, why do men get infections? Well, I think Charles alluded to that, that he wasn't drinking as much. He, he wasn't flushing away bacteria. And, and, and as the prostate enlarges, some men start not to empty their bladder properly. So they're always leaving behind, you know, half a pint of urine. And that that is a potential um, precipitating factor for, for subsequently developing an infection. Sure. All right. OK, so. Not a good thing to have. Let's do something about it. What treatments are available? Uh, I mean, I, I, I can imagine surgery is 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 one. Yeah. So obviously, Charles has made some, made some lifestyle changes initially, but that wasn't enough. And we can give medication, but the medication often works for a few years, and then the beneficial effects wear off. And also, there are side effects with those medication, and a lot of men don't want to be taking one or two tablets every day as a constant reminder of the fact they're getting older. Um, <laughs> th th there are operations, um, and historically for many, many years, decades, we've had an operation called TURP, which is um, done through the natural orifice, through the urethra, and the obstructing prostate tissue was removed. And that's a, it's a reasonable operation. It, men still have it in, in the UK, but essentially there are a range, a portfolio of options now, many of which are, are minimally invasive and, and uh, what, you know, there are lasers we use, but also uh, minimally invasive treatments such as um, where, you know, something called Eurolift and in Charles's case, the resume or water vapor treatment. OK, right, we'll go, go into a, a couple of those in a, in a bit more detail. What was the one yeah. before water vapor yeah. therapy, something or other lift? Yeah, so the, the, the minimally invasive treatments and I, I mean, what how we define a minimally invasive treatment is up for discussion, but I think it's something that to, is quick to perform that doesn't um, that can potentially be done under local anaesthetic and that doesn't sort of involve doing too much you know it, it, you know you're not scraping away lots of prostate tissue and with the Eurolift you use little titanium implants to pin back like treasury tags the lobes the obstructing inside the, the urethra lobes or, or uh, swellings of prostate tissue um, with the water vapor treatment we go up through the penis and um, inject using a little needle um, steam at 103 degrees Celsius into the prostate tissue and it kills that prostate tissue and then the body heals it the prostate and it shrinks that dead tissue disappears and wow. the prostate okay. reduces I have to say, the your 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 description um is alarming me somewhat the idea of steam anywhere near my prostate and associated uh, areas and um, fills me with fear. Uh, Charles, did, have you had this this um, procedure done on you? 
Yes, I have had the procedure done on me, but, uh, uh, you know, I was in good hands. and I was uh, asleep at the time. So uh, I, I woke up um, uh, an hour or so later and everything was fine. <laughs> OK, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. So so this idea of having, um, well, it's a bit of it's superheated steam, 104 degrees, not just 100. Um, Richard, I imagine you have a very steady hand. Yes, that does help. And you're right, it is. It's been optimised um, to 103 degrees Celsius. So at that temperature, um, and it's under sort of low pressure, the steam disperses into the tissues of the prostate gland, but it doesn't. It con confines itself to the zone, the bit of the prostate you've injected in it, it, injected it into. So it doesn't heat up the nerves or any of the important, important plumbing that that's nearby. So it has a very favourable side effect profile. It doesn't tend to upset sexual function nor does it upset urinary control or or you know and there, there is no risk of urinary incontinence which some men obviously will worry about with the bigger yeah. procedures but all, all this is very positive look i've got one question which is a sort of man in the street question i think though when 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 if, whenever you have damage on your body and you get scar tissue to repair it the scar tissue is usually kind of a bit bigger a bit lumpier isn't it do, so is that not does it not make things worse? Um, yeah, it's quite clever because you only make little punctures in the skin, the inner lining. So there is minimal scarring, and and um, you know the 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 the, the, the tissue that's removed it, that's happening the other side of of, of the skin, if you like. Um, so when you look in, if you ever have a reason to inspect somebody a year after they've had the resumed treatment, um, there is there is a very minimal scarring. Often you can't even tell that they've had something done other than seeing that the prostate is smaller than it was and, and, and the fact that it doesn't look like it's pressing so much on the urethra. Okay, all right. So, all, all, I mean, all this sounds like really good news. Has, has this particular uh, procedure, water vapour therapy, uh, been around for a long time? Or was Charles a bit of a guinea pig? Uh, no, no, it's been around. I mean, it, it, it came from Silicon Valley, as a lot of technologies do. And, and so it's been in the US for seven or eight years now. It's been in the UK for over five years. And we in Basingstoke performed the first cases in 2017. Um, Charles wasn't one of the first ones that's had the treatment. And, and it's now in the process. It's, it's approved by NICE. It's being uh, adopted in uh, NHS hospitals around the country. Um, and it's been promoted by the NHS. They're keen for hospitals to adopt this technology because it reduces the waiting list burden because people don't need a bed. They don't need to stay in overnight. Um, mm. And it's also um, you know, relatively cost efficient. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something the, the NHS has really endorsed and badged and is, is pushing and encouraging to, uh, other urologists to use. Yeah, well, let, let, let's get the... Um... Uh, the, the kind of reaction from a user Charles how, was this you just went in for like an hour or two did you and then skipped home it, it was a day case um so so I, I was there in the morning as, as is usually the case when you have these sort of procedures um and um it was a morning operation I, I, I think I was probably under anaesthetic for less than an hour um and I woke up in a in a, in a room and um uh, I was catheterized, which is um, normal, I think, for the first week um, after you've had the procedure. Um, and um, then um, uh, I had to go back for another visit to have, have the catheter removed. And um, uh, over time, there was um, a, a, a gradual improvement. Um, in, in the early days, um, it didn't seem to be a lot different. But as Richard was describing, the the, the sites that have been steam treated shrink back. Um, and then, um, you know, two to three months down the line, there was quite a, a noticeable difference. And uh, I'm, I'm here now, what, nearly 18 months later. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm fairly happy with the improvement that I've seen. So are you sleeping away all the way through the night, Charles? Uh, well, last night I, I settled just before midnight. And I slept through till about six this morning. So that's pretty good. I'd say that is fantastic. And when you go I mean, out, previously, uh, previously I would be up at least twice in the night, maybe three times. Okay, so it's, it appears to have definitely worked for you, Charles. 
it def definitely has also going places i mean i'm happy to jump in the car now and drive a couple of hours up the road without really too much worry whereas um you know before i would be um looking to reduce all my fluid intakes for breakfast and um you know probably be hunting for a lay-by after you know 60 to 70 minutes i would have thought sure all right so a definite success in your case charles yeah so yeah that, definitely works good back back to you richard you mentioned about it being available on the on the nhs is this available sort of throughout the country on the nhs or what what's the situation at the moment um uh, no, it's not yet available everywhere, but I think um, it, it's in the process of being rolled out. You know, the, there's something called the medical technology funding mandate, which sounds complicated, but it's basically a, a way of trying to remove red tape and facilitate a, a easier introduction of a technology into an NHS hospital because, you know, the NHS is under a lot of strain, that the management are very busy managing lots of other things. And and it's always a bit of a pain to try when you try and bring in something new. Sure. Um, but this is, this is an incentive to make it easier. Uh, I would say at least 20 NHS hospitals around the country, it's probably closer to 30, um, have it in place or in the process of bringing it in. Um, so, and, you know, I would imagine within the next year or so, at least, you know, 50% of NHS hospitals will have it. There may not be need for every single hospital to have this treatment because we're encouraged for you know um, that, that in adjacent hospitals network together so that we patients have access to all of the options but then everybody can be good at what they're doing if that makes sense because sure. you know if everyone's doing a bit of everything you tend not to be as good at it yeah all right so if men are listening to this and thinking mm, you know what you could be describing me when you were talking about the symptoms earlier on what's the, the first thing they should do uh, I think that uh, it, you know it'd be very reasonable to to book an appointment with their GP. I mean, they can they can obviously go online, but that that's often with some trepidation. Um, there is something called the International Prostate Symptom Score. So if people type IPSS on the internet, and that's a way you can sort of score yourself as to how bad your symptoms are, um, uh, um, and that's quite a good way of reflecting on how much trouble you're having. And a lot of men are worried that that their symptoms might be caused by prostate cancer. So it's, it would be very reasonable to, to ask your GP to have a prostate blood test. Usually the symptoms are not caused by cancer. They're caused by this benign enlargement. But we always like to make sure there isn't a, a problem with cancer, um, of course, and a blood test is a very reasonable way of doing that and then moving on to dealing with the symptoms of enlargement. Right. So give your GP a call. Get down and see your GP. That seems to be the, the, yeah. the first step. Yeah. All right. Look, I think this is potentially useful uh, for lots of guys. So uh, Charles and Richard, thank you very much indeed for uh, chatting about it this morning. No problem. Nice talking to you. Not at all. Yeah, my pleasure. So if any of the symptoms that have been mentioned on this show are relevant to you, please do go to the doctor and get them checked out. Or if someone you know is affected by them, persuade them to go to the doctor themselves you can uh, persuade them verbally you have my permission to pick them up and drag them off to the doctor if needs be but seriously please do try and persuade them to do something about it so many thanks to my guests on this week's show and they were uh, dr roger henderson uh, richard hendley and charles blanford and of course thank you to you for listening the Relax Back UK show with me, Mike Dill. Thank you for listening and please do join us again next time.